We have just lived through and are continuing to live through the greatest public health fiasco in the history of the world. And it's being touted as a triumph. It's the most Orwellian moment in American history, if you ask me. And what's more, in the course of this, we've been pitted against each other. Neighbor against neighbor, family member against family member. You're a bad person because you went out to dinner tonight. You're a bad person. You did this, you did that, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. The authorities told us this or that, you didn't do that. You're a bad person. You don't follow the science, but I do, they say. Okay, these are people who yell at you for not wearing a mask while you're jogging, and they're going to lecture you about not listening to the science. Okay. The governor of Nevada, a week or so ago, scolded citizens of his state for their bad behavior. Because as we all know, only bad behavior can account for the rise in cases. And he basically told them, I'm not going to come back two weeks from now and give you people another chance. He's treating everybody like they're seven. They're, they're just innocently going about trying to make their livings, for heaven's sake. Three days after this little lecture, you know how the story ends, he came down with the virus. After he just lectured everybody about this, and he said, you can take all the precautions there are and still get it. I have no idea how I got it. Should we lecture him for his bad behavior? Should we treat him like he's seven? The whole thing's ridiculous. Then the former Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, posted this on Twitter, November 15th. I so appreciate everyone's good wishes. How did we catch it? I don't know. We wore masks. We socially distanced. We avoided crowds. We haven't had people in our house. Hmm. Then just yesterday in the Los Angeles Times, we read the following. The virus itself hasn't changed, and there has been little relaxation of the rules. Yeah, you can say that again in California. Interviews conducted with people who have recently tested positive for the coronavirus don't show any significant shifts in behavior compared with a month ago and yet they have rising cases. Well, there's a fellow on Twitter who's hated by all the doomers named Alex Berenson, and he likes to say, virus gonna virus. And our attempted voodoo to stop it doesn't seem to be all that effective. Most people wear masks. If masks don't adequately bring down the number of cases, then we're told people must not be wearing them. It can't be that they're inadequate, that they don't really do much. It has to be well, just people aren't complying. But yet you look around, everybody's got them on. Uh, the United States now has approximately an 88% compliance rate. And we were told if we could just get to 80%, that, would, that should pretty much do it. In fact, the head of the CDC said that if Americans would just wear masks for four to six weeks, then we should see things really start to peter out. Now, even Michael Osterholm, who's on the Biden COVID team, said that remark was, quote, unfortunate. <laughs> the word unfortunate is academic speak for BS. Because all you need to do now is look at charts of countries that have been masked up for months at a time. And the cases are still rising. So, so much for that claim. So, whatever argument you want to have about the effectiveness of masks, the claim that was advanced by the CDC director that four to six weeks of masking should do it is, is disproven in case after case, of country after country around the world, it is disproven. In April, the UN estimated that the radical interruptions of commerce that took place because of the lockdowns could result in hundreds of thousands of additional child deaths in 2020, not to mention 42 to 66 million children to extreme poverty. The Atlantic said, when you ask them to stay home, in many cases, you're asking them to starve. Who's them? People in the developing world. Can you imagine being such a sicko that you think lockdowns are an appropriate response in the developing world, where people make maybe $2 a day? If they can't make that $2, I think we know what happens to them. And there, have, there are countries where the average age is pretty low. They don't have as many vulnerable people. The makes no sense at all. It's obviously going to kill magnitudes more people 
than the virus ever would. And I've given the example of Malawi, one of the poorest countries in the world, when they got wind of what their government was up to, going to shut them down, their people rose up, hat tip to Scott Atlas, and said, we're not doing this. There will be no shutdown in this country. And so there wasn't one in Malawi because the people refused to allow it. <laughs> Here's something that was fact-checked by Facebook. In Oakland, California, something called the Wellbeing Trust released a study trying to figure out how many deaths of despair would be caused by all this. Now, they didn't mean just the lockdowns. Obviously, people might also resort to drug and alcohol abuse or suicide uh, because of the disease itself. And that's certainly uh, quite possible. But they said putting that all together, they did an estimate of about 75,000 excess deaths of despair, more than we would have had otherwise. And this was fact-checked. They said, well, we don't actually have these numbers yet. Okay, these are the same people who are modeling what the future is going to hold for the, for the virus. Well, we don't have those numbers yet either. I mean, how am I supposed to fact-check those? Those are all modeling for the future. Th these are the same people who went along with the Imperial College model, uh, or, or it could have been University of Washington, I forget which one, one of the two mainstream models that predicted that in June, Sweden would have 96,000 deaths if it didn't lock down. They had 4,000. Would I have been allowed to fact-check that back then and say, well, you don't have any evidence that there are going to be 96,000 deaths, because I would have been right. So they can model, I can't. Okay, well, that's the fact-checking. Coast is home to a little under 130 million people. And 130 million is the number of people in the world that our global overreaction to COVID has, has pushed to the brink of starvation, according to the World Health Organization. Do you support lockdowns? You may think you're being virtuous, but you're being selfish. Imagine driving from Portland, Maine, through Boston, New York City, Philadelphia, DC, Atlanta, Miami. Now imagine everybody you saw on your trip start, all 130 million of them. Those are faces of lockdowns. Add to that people right here who are so afraid, right here at home, so afraid of COVID, they stay home having strokes and heart attacks. They stay home or are delayed from chemo and other life maintaining, uh, life maintaining treatments. Some sit alone in despair, drinking alcohol or abusing drugs. Some lash out at spouses and children who have no school or social life in which to find refuge or help or detection. Kids growing up spending formative chunks of their lives learning that being close to another human is dangerous and the very breath we exhale is poison. And not to mention, we know the extent to which nonverbal communication contributes to ordinary baby and child development. We have babies growing up in a world where they've almost never seen a human face. I guess you don't have to worry about that either. You don't think that's going to have long-term effects? Alzheimer's patients confused, lost in their own fading world with no one working to keep them afloat, they drown in their isolation. Grandparents denied the joy of one of the definitive pleasures of life, hugging a grandchild or seeing the joy of their faces Christmas morning. But lockdown saved lives, you cry. But denying human contact, scaring people to despair, is this saving lives? And how many lives does it save? The current state of lockdown science, such as it is, appears to be this. We have no idea what we're doing, but if something brings people pleasure, we, could, we should probably just discontinue that. And if something causes great inconvenience or even pain, we should probably do that. I can't make head or tail of the policy other than through that metric. Well, what's going on in Europe right now? Well, here, crunching the numbers is our friend Alex Berenson on Twitter. Now, he says, France's seven-day positive test average, and now I'm, I'm talking to you just to date this, November 20th, 2020. Everybody knows what year it is, I suppose. France's seven-day positive test average is now down almost 60% from the early November peak, and Spain is down 40% from its late October peak. So, people will try to claim that the French lockdown on October 30th must account for this. But the problem with that story is Spain didn't lock down, and they still had that result. Spain did not close their businesses. They did impose a curfew 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. That was effective October 25th. But 
as this, this fellow at, at COVID tweets points out, ca cases had stabilized on the 20th, which means the infection peak was October 13th. So the Spain magical intervention helped before it even went into effect. Same thing with the UK. They enacted lockdown November 5th, but cases were flat since October 24th, and with a minimum seven-day delay between an infection and being counted as a case, infections were stable since mid-October. So again, lockdowns are so effective, they work two weeks before you even do them. You see, I mean, when, as soon as you dig, you see through the BS. Germany, Germany's lockdown, November 2nd. But again, with the lag, their infections were flat since around October 25th. So the, these people are going to try to get away with claiming that the lockdowns did it. That's why we have to stay on top of the numbers, not let them. Same thing, we could say the same thing for, for Belgium as well. Well, there's a vaccine coming, people say, so maybe we'll return to normal. Now, maybe, maybe. But yet, the Secretary of Health in Pennsylvania said, when people get the vaccine, they're still going to wear masks, they still need to social distance, and avoid large gatherings. And by large gatherings, you can translate that as everything fun. <laughs> okay, so what are we doing here? So again, we still have to live like this? Even after the vaccine, when are you people going to leave us alone? I, by the way, maybe I shouldn't say, maybe it's out of line for me to say, but don't ever be intimidated by public health officials. <laughs> By and large, weren't bright enough to get into medical school. And here's their one chance for people to pay attention to them. They're going to take it. We're dealing with people who think the economy is like that guy on the Monopoly board. You know, that short little guy. Like he's not wearing a monocle, although we all remember him as wearing one. He's not. But they imagine the economy is made up of short, white-haired people wearing a monocle, carrying sacks of money with dollar signs on them, just, just, just thirsty for profits, and that's the economy. The economy is something that they're just too superior even to, to bother to study. All they know is there's a lot of wickedness in it. Well, how can you have a conversation with people like this? Of course they're going to think, well, the econ well, we can just keep things closed, we'll just print the money, or we'll just say the government will get... It's all just nonsensical childishness. Guidance is fine, voluntary self-isolation is fine, and strongly advisable for the more vulnerable. Most of them will do it by choice, but coercion is not fine. There is no moral or principal justification for it. What sort of life do we think we are protecting? There is more to life than the avoidance of death. Life is a drink with friends. Life is a crowded football match or a live concert. Life is a family celebration with children and grandchildren. Life is companionship, an arm around one's back. Tears shared at less than years. These things are not just optional extras. They are life itself. They are fundamental to our humanity, to our existence as social beings. That's Lord Sumption. Here's all Woods here. Well, you can cheer for Lord Sumption. He deserves it. <laughs> what I want to close with is a mission for you in this room. People who are living in irrational fear of the virus already have their representatives, the entire entertainment world, the media, virtually all of the political class. And the rest of us have almost no one. People whose family members died because their procedures were indefinitely postponed or who lost, lost a loved one to suicide, who've had everything they've poured their hearts into crushed and destroyed, they have no one. Elderly people dying of social isolation and who are told they can see their grandkids through a window or over Zoom, but who think they themselves can best judge what life they want to live likewise have no one to speak for them. You may have heard of the case in Colorado, Fair Acres Manor. People in wheelchairs holding signs saying, rather die from COVID than loneliness, or prisoners in our own home, or give us freedom. One of the administrators at that nursing home said they want to be able to hug their grandchildren. They want to be able to hold the hands of their loved ones. And one of the residents said, we did this because one thing we have to look forward to is a simple hug. It gives us meaning. The physical and mental health toll of the restrictions and shutdowns is staggering. 
and nobody's allowed to mention it for fear of being told they want grandmothers to die, no one will speak for them except you. People will hate you for this. Automatons who can do nothing but repeat CBS News talking points will think you're terrible. The rest of us will consider you a hero with every speech you give, every article you write, every social media post, every attempt to resist, you'll be a hero. There's nobody coming to the rescue. You must be the voice of the voiceless because if it isn't you, it will be no one. Thank you.